Good morning. Please stand and join us in singing. different preferences and styles of music and worship, uh, but it's comforting to know that God receives our praise in no matter what style it's delivered in, right? Um, at Grantham Church, you probably have noticed we seek to incorporate a lot of different styles of music and worship into our services, um, and we do occasionally offer times to go a little bit deeper into a particular style. So today is one of those days this afternoon. If you're interested in more of those traditional hymns, you resonate a lot with that style of worship, we invite you to come back today at 4 o'clock for a hymn sing, bring your requests, uh, and that'll be a fun time to connect with God and one another. 
I also just want to mention that if you're newer to Grantham Church and wanting to connect more with us, there is a card in front of you that you can fill out and drop in the offering plate later to help us get to know you and for us to follow up and share a little bit more about what God is doing here. Let's join our hearts together in prayer at this time. Gracious God, we're so thankful for the breadth and diversity in your family. We're grateful that you welcome everyone into your family, no matter our background, no matter our personality, and no matter our failures. You receive us as we are, and we praise you for that. Yet you love us enough not to allow us to stay in our broken state. Lord, we pause for a moment and ask you to show us the ways this week that we have not fully trusted and followed you, including the ways we have not loved and served our neighbors. Forgive us, Lord. Thank you that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from unrighteousness. Help us to know how to better walk in your way. God, we're so grateful for the ways you're at work all around us. As we think about unity in the church today, we celebrate how you've been bringing churches together more and more in our region to partner for the sake of the gospel. We think of the Capital Region Gospel Partnership, our relationship with Ignite Church, and other ministry partners where various congregations are coming together to meet the tangible and spiritual needs of our neighbors. Lord, help us to continue leaning into the unity that you provide for us in Jesus Christ. Grow our love for one another and allow that to be a beautiful reflection of who you are, God. Father, we also want to lift up to you the needs and concerns on our hearts today. They are big and small. They are local and global, both for ourselves and for others. We quietly present those to you now. Thank you that you care for all of these, God, and we can trust that you are working out your purposes. We pray now for your will to be done, just as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's continue our worship now as the ushers come forward, as we give in response to how God has given to us, and as we hear some special music.
see all of you in worship this morning. If you're visiting with us, welcome. My name is David Flowers. I'm the senior pastor here at Grantham. Uh, before we get into the sermon this morning, we have a special guest with us, and I want to recognize him. Dr. Ray Motsi has been president of the Theological College of Zimbabwe since 2011. And before that, he pastored the Buleo, uh, Buleo Baptist Church from 1990 to 2010 as well as serving as adjunct lecturer in practical theology at the college, which trains pastors from all over Southern Africa and has probably prepared more VIC pastors in the world than any other college. Over 20 years ago, Dr. Motsi founded and continues to serve with Grace to Heal, which is a faith-based organization focusing on community peacemaking and conflict transformation in Zimbabwe. Dr. Motsi is active in Mennonite Central Committee, one of our ministry partners, and related activities such as being a trainer of local church leaders across Southern Africa and the area of peace and conflict resolution. We want to invite Dr. Motsi to come give us uh, brief greetings. Would you welcome him to the stage, please? Dr. Motsi, welcome, sir. Thank you. San Bonan. Uh, greetings uh, from the part of the world uh, where I come. And I thank you for this opportunity to bring greetings to you, particularly from Bishop Sinda Ngulube, who is the presiding bishop of the Brethren Christ Church. Uh, in Southern Africa at the moment, and uh, also EBI, Ekupumuleni Bible Institute, which is the Brethren Christ Theological College that trains diploma students, theological students, and the whole group of Mchabezi Mission, where the founding of the Zimbabwe Mission, Brethren Christ Mission, is from. That's where I hail from, and I bring greetings to you. And lastly, from the Theological College of Zimbabwe, of which I am the president, where 99% of the 
of all the overseers uh, in Zimbabwe of the Brethren Christ have been trained. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Motsi. We're so glad and we're honored that you're here with us this morning. And uh, God's blessings on the work that you're doing in Southern Africa. The sermon this morning is entitled, Oneness, Church Unity in a Time of Division. I'm wondering, would there be a few of you who'd be willing to pray for me and for folks in this room throughout this message? Would you just raise your hand if you would be willing to do that? Thank you. I appreciate that. I think we'll discover this morning that something that is so important to Jesus is also opposed by the enemy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to worship together. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to open up our hearts and our minds to you now, to hear your voice above all other voices. Lord, help us to be aware of our flesh. May we resist it. Help us to repent of sin. Help us to repent of the ways in which we have fueled the fires of division and polarization. Lord, give us clarity to what you want with your church, what you want in this world. Speak now, Lord, for your servants are listening. All of God's people said, amen, amen, thank you. If you have your Bible, you can open that up if, you, if you're able to God, the Gospel of John chapter 17. I'm not going to read the entire passage that you see in front of you, John 17, verse 1 through 26. I just want to summarize that, but I would encourage you to take some time, sometime today, and read all of this prayer of Jesus. This is the final prayer of Jesus before he is arrested and, of course, crucified. The last chapter of what is known as the farewell discourse, we read Jesus' prayer to the Father, and up to this point in the story, Jesus has shared Passover with his disciples. He's talked about leaving his disciples, about him, uh, about the disciples abiding in him, staying faithful despite opposition that is coming, that he is the way and the truth and the life. He says that there in chapter 14, and he shares about the coming gift of the Holy Spirit to empower them, to help them carry out the task which he has given them. In chapter 17, Jesus then concludes his farewell and final teachings with a lengthy prayer, which the disciples are obviously present for, and they overhear. Jesus wants them to hear this prayer because this prayer is for them. Now think about that. Jesus wants them to hear this prayer for them. Now if you're a parent in the room, I think you can probably understand that. Maybe better than most, the power of your children hearing the prayer that you speak over them. You can think of Jesus doing just that, for his disciples. As we'll hear today, his prayer, though, isn't just for them. It's also for us. In chapter 16, verse 32, Jesus says, they will soon scatter and abandon him. You remember that? Jesus said this. This was coming, and this will not be the last time they'll be tempted to abandon their Lord and scatter like frightened sheep because hardship is coming. As Jesus prays, he asks the Father not to remove his disciples from the world, but rather to protect them from the evil one through their spiritual union with him and to be a faithful presence, to be sanctified, to be made holy, to be set apart amidst the world despite the challenges and threats to come from the world who hates them. 
that hates us, Jesus said. Let's read now some of the final verses of that prayer. I have that on the screen for you. You can read along in your Bible. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. John 17, verses 20 through 23. Jesus said, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Again, don't miss that. Jesus is praying for us. Verse 21, he says, I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Look at that. Just as you and I are one. There are distinct persons here. The Father, the Son, and of course, the Spirit. But you're not unified there in love and purpose and mission. Jesus is saying that the world's belief in his identity and mission is dependent upon our oneness. Verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me so they may be one as we are one. Glory, the Greek word there is doxa, which we get the word doxology. The Hebrew word is kavod, and it refers to the brilliance, the majesty, and the wonder of God's essence. This glory, if perceived rightly, undiluted, right, untainted, in its purest form, has the effect of drawing God's creatures into oneness. That is, of course, if we are, as N.T. Wright would say, like angled mirrors reflecting the glory of God into the world and the glory of God back to Himself by the way in which we live. This is what Jesus is speaking of. Verse 23, He says, I, I am in them and you are in me. And I know this is mystical, but follow. We have to believe this as followers of Jesus. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Perfect unity there um, in the English. The NIV says complete, complete unity. That is to add what is lacking so that it is, is whole just as it should be. What the designer intended, right? So that the world will know, of course, sounds a lot like If you know the Gospel of John, John 13, verse 35, Jesus said, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We need to see the connection in the Gospel of John there, chapter 13 with chapter 17. The whole world will know we're Jesus' disciples by our love for each other and, of course, for our enemies. And here is Jesus saying, the whole world will know that Jesus was sent by the Father, what his mission is, what the good news is, if we not only love, but are also one. In fact, that's what love does. Love brings oneness, true love. And so notice that, according to Jesus, this unity is a current spiritual reality, but also something that must be sought after to maintain and protect. Think of it this way, in this statement, our unity as brothers and sisters in Christ is not only a spiritual reality given to us by Jesus, but also a relational discipline that we practice as a gift to give back to Jesus. Our unity is both a spiritual fact and a spiritual fight. So think of this, probably the relational discipline is is what we understand the most right? Unity that takes effort. We have a part to play. We need, we need to do something. But it's the spiritual reality that we first need to sit with so that we can understand its implications. So don't miss what Jesus is saying. The spiritual reality um, may feel like it's intangible. Our experience might fool us, but the reality is established It's created and established in a higher dimension. Let me say that again. 
This reality is created and established in a higher dimension than our senses. I know all analogies sometimes fall short, you know, but here's one. Try this one on. You can be married and yet be far from home, away from your spouse. But the question is, despite how I might feel in the moment and the distance that may exist between the bride and the bridegroom, will I live according to the truth and the spiritual reality that exists by the sacred covenant that I made or not? So there is a real spiritual reality, let's take for a husband and a wife, despite the, the distance that might be between them or is felt between them, but the sacred covenant is real, it's active, it's in effect. How do we get in touch with that? I submit to you the more that we pursue the glory of God, the more that we live alone for the glory of God the more we will experience this as a spiritual reality. Therefore, our unity is both a spiritual fact and a spiritual fight. How so? Let's look at a few scriptures and see where this is rooted. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 through 16. Unity is a fact, right? Paul wrote this. And another thing you might read is the whole book of Ephesians. It's, it's one of my favorites. To, to think about, based on what I'm going to be sharing today, think about this is what Paul is really getting at. God's mission and his eternal purpose for the church and what it looks like when it's fleshed out. So I'm going to just jump around here in a few different places in Ephesians, give you a taste of that. Chapter 2, verse 14, unity is fact. He says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united, not is uniting, he united. <laughs> he united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Now think about that. Verse 14, Jesus healed and brought together a great divide between Jew and Gentile. That is a racial, cultural, political, and religious divide between Jews and Gentiles. That's no small wall. And it says that Jesus did this. He united Jews and Gentiles. He broke down the wall of hostility that separated. Folks, that is the reality. Will we live in to the reality that Jesus has made? Verse 15, he did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace, he made peace between Jews and Gentiles back by creating in himself one new people or one new humanity from the two groups. Jesus did this. He created one new humanity out of his own body. Now, I think Paul is using a metaphor here. He's using a metaphor to say, in other words, through his own person and saving work, Jesus birthed the church in the power of the Holy Spirit. He did this within himself and by his work on the cross. Verse 16, he says, together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross and our hostility, our hostility toward each other was put to death. Brothers and sisters, the cross of Christ brought an end to the old and ushered in the new. That is the reality. The cross of Christ means that Jesus took upon himself the sins of us all, especially our fear, our anger, our violence, our hate, our desire for retribution, our refusal to forgive and show mercy. Playing the tit-for-tat game, the eye-for-eye, tooth-for-tooth game, Jesus took it all upon himself on the cross. And through the cross, we see that we are all loved and in need of mercy, grace, and salvation. So unity is a fact, but it's also a fight. A couple chapters later in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul says this in verses 1 through 6, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Paul, you see, is writing to the Ephesians from prison, 
Don't forget that, from prison. And he says, remember the Lord you follow in the invitation and calling that you have received from him. Verse 2, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Look at that, bearing with one another in love. This is not tolerance. This is not tolerance. Tolerance is cheap. Tolerance is a low bar, folks. It may be a virtue of the culture, but Jesus calls us to something higher. It's not putting up with someone. This is not what Jesus is saying when he says to bear with each other in love. Bearing with one another in love means that we think of our own sins when we encounter the sins of others. Did you hear that? We think of our own sins when we encounter the sins of others. Now, often we encounter the sins of others, we're like, how? <laughs> that, that sorry, no good for nothing. How could they do that? How could they think that way? Well, just look in the mirror. You'll have your answer. So this is what we mean. We encounter the sins of others. We think of our own sins and the price that Jesus paid to cover them. This should have a humbling effect. It should, it should cause us to say, God has been so gracious and merciful to me. God has been so good to me. How can I not return the favor? How can I not extend to others what has been extended to me? I think this is what Paul is getting at. Look at verse 3. Make every effort, every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Don't miss this. It, it is the Spirit who brings unity. If there is real unity in a church, it is because the body of Christ is yielding to the Spirit. Let me say that again. If there is real unity in a church, not uniformity, not sweeping things under the rug, refusing to address them and acknowledge the reality of differences, but if there is real unity in a church where we're bearing up with one another in love, it's because the body of Christ is yielding and submitting to the Holy Spirit. Likewise, if there is not unity, it's because the church is resisting the way of Jesus in their individual hearts, in their daily lives, and through their relationships, period. Now, we've probably all been a part of a local congregation that has experienced disunity. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced disunity in a church. Come on. Should be every one of you if you've ever set foot in a church. And we can certainly look outside our window and see this happening in the world. So, how does that happen? It happens because people, all of us, together, in a corporate way, as, as well as individual, refuse to submit and yield to the Holy Spirit. That's our answer. That's where we need to, to be. This is how we seek unity, by yielding and submitting to the Spirit. This is how we make every effort in that Spirit to keep the unity of the Spirit. Verse 4 through 6, he says, There's one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, how many lords? One Lord. How many faiths? One faith. How many baptisms? One baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Church, the God of love, the heart of our faith is about union with Christ and each other. This is our common bond. And that bond ought to be greater than all other loyalties and allegiances. Notice what wasn't in there was one party, one theology, one way of reading the Bible, etc., etc. I'm preaching. So here in Ephesians, Paul says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 15, verse 5 through 7. Again, I encourage you to read all of 1 through 7. Uh, but I'll just read th these two verses here. May God, who gives patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other, as is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And look at the words I've bolded there. In the Greek, it does pay for some of us to know some Greek. This is really enlightening. The word that's used there is homothumadon. Homothumadon. Now, I've, I've given a notation there for verse 6. This means one or same 
added word tuma, which means passion or rage. And that, that looks a lot like Phil Tuma's name. Um, our church treasurer is not like that, I can assure you. He's been quite happy lately with all of our giving. But you think two Greek words put together to say this, and you could translate it literally this way, then all of you can fight passionately, furiously for oneness. Fight for it. In the way of Jesus, you can join together then with one voice, giving praise and glory to God. Verse 7, therefore, accept each other just as Christ accept, has accepted you so that God will be given glory. We've said this before here at Grantham. I'm going to say this again. Please hear this clearly. Acceptance is not the same as agreement. And again, we're not talking about tolerance. That's cheap. We're talking about bearing up with one another and love. So acceptance is not the same as agreement. And when we confuse acceptance and agreement, we tend to withhold acceptance in order to communicate our disagreement. Have you noticed that problem in the evangelical church? <laughs> Have you ever noticed that at work in you? If I go there, if I do this, if I am seen with that person or at that event, what will people think? Folks, the only person you should be caring about and what they think is Jesus. And Jesus was known as a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He was even called a drunkard once. How does that happen? We really need to think about the way of Jesus and what it looks like when we don't just give lip service to it, but embody it. Put it in flesh and bone and live it out. Acceptance is not the same as agreement. And so when, again, we confuse acceptance and agreement, we tend to withhold acceptance. Don't do that. Don't worry. Jesus is with you. He's leading you, actually. So what does this look like, fleshed out in the community of the church? Well, if you're, you know, you've been trekking with us for a little while now here at Grantham. You know that we've been working to develop and cultivate what you could call a homothumadon culture that keeps Christ at the center of our life together. It's what we mean by being a centered set church. You've seen this graphic before? Uh, we, we talk about being centered set. There are also a couple extremes, and most of us have probably experienced one or the other. My guess is most of us have experienced the bounded church. With a bounded church, there are clear lines of who is in and who is out. That kind of church focuses on the boundaries. It demands that everyone think alike, especially in all the hot-button issues. In fact, I was just talking to a pastor this week, um, fairly new to his congregation here in Susquehanna Conference of the Brethren in Christ, trying to cultivate new culture in his church, having some challenges around the issue of waging peace. Imagine that. And someone who has an occupation that isn't necessarily known for peacemaking in the way of Jesus. Some difficult conversations. And the couple that he was having a conversation with could not get their minds around the fact that you could disagree and still worship with each other. Because this person comes from a bounded set church culture. This is what it does, and this is not the way of Jesus. Jesus. This is not the model that we want to embrace at Grantham. Likewise, we don't want to embrace the opposite extreme of that. How many people my age, late Gen Xers, millennials, who have experienced the bounded set and think, well, the answer is let's move to a fuzzy church where it doesn't matter what you believe or how you behave. You know, as long as you're not hurting anybody or offending anybody, that sounds like very American, doesn't it? You're good. You're good. But this is also in error. The removal of all the lines and the boundaries with no clear direction. This church is a reaction to the bounded set and is often seduced by the spirit of the age. So we can't go that route either. You know, before you know it, you don't have a Christ to cling to. You, you, you throw out all of the important things about the Christian faith, it makes it to Christian faith. 
It makes it radical. It makes it absurd. And let's keep the absurdness in Christianity. Let's keep Christianity weird and subversive. And you know, one time I was serving in a church, and this may shock you, it was actually an elder of the church said, why don't we talk about the blood of Jesus all the time? You know, it's like, well, and why not Pepsi and Doritos instead of wine? And bread? Seriously? If you look at the, the early church, I mean, for 2,000 years, we've known how weird it is. And yet we do it because Jesus commissioned us to do it. And because the closer you come to it, folks, as you come to the table today, you see the mystery and the wonder and the beauty. They can't be seen with worldly eyes, but only when you're born again of the Spirit. So there's the centered church, the one that we're inviting folks to live into here. How do we define that? We define it this way. A centered church discerns who belongs to the group by observing people's relationship with the center. That is Jesus. This group includes all who are orienting their hearts toward the center. Is Jesus the center of your life? Is Jesus your passion? Or is it some political agenda? Or some other hobby horse? Is this a country club to you? We'll quickly find out whether or not your heart is oriented toward Jesus. It will be apparent, at least to those whose hearts are oriented toward Jesus. Amen? So the common direction of orienting our hearts toward Jesus, that's what brings the unity. There's space to struggle in a centered church and to fail because we believe that everyone is in process. All of us and all of you who are in the room this morning, you, you come from a certain background, you're in a certain place in your walk with Jesus, and every one of us, just look around the room, we're all this morning saying, we're meeting you where you are. That's going to be messy. Yeah, Jesus came for sinners, not for those that don't need a doctor. So if that's you, you're in good company. A centered approach remedies the problems of a bounded church that motivate a fuzzy church to blur boundaries while also avoiding the negative fruit that grows out of a fuzzy approach. It's not that, all, that beliefs and behaviors don't matter. They certainly do. Uh, Mark Baker, in his book, The Centered Set Church, the focus of a centered church is on helping people move closer to the center rather than trying to make sure they're not crossing any lines. Why? Because that's what Jesus shows us. This process invites people to explore one another, each other's stories. It creates space for nuance and complexity, messiness. Of course, you can see that this form of community is entirely dependent upon the Holy Spirit if it's going to work of us yielding and submitting to the Spirit, as we said earlier. And we, we become a centered church by holding grace and truth together. John told us that earlier in his gospel. Jesus came in grace and truth. Not just truth, not just grace, grace and truth. We hold those together. We hold those together in worshiping God and discipling people in Christ, the Scriptures and the Spirit's power to radically love our neighbors and our world. That should sound familiar to Granthamites. That's our mission. And so, yes, we must, as Paul said, accept each other as Christ has accepted you while also recognizing that this sort of inclusion also involves each of us deciding if we're going to do the hard work of belonging to others as we pursue Christ, you can call it self-inclusion in the centered church. We have the, the, the responsibility of accepting, of meeting people where they are, but you also have a responsibility to include yourself. You know, the uh, farmers, you probably heard this before, in the Australian outback, the, the, the land is so expansive they don't bother with fences and you know it's hot in Australia, getting hotter by the way, what do they do? They dig whales. They dig a whale and they know that the cattle, the livestock, is not going to go too far. They want to know where the whale is. They, 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 they have to come back to the whale to drink, to live. And that's how they do it. That's how they keep their flock, their cattle, 
together. <laughs> Just dig a well. Folks, Jesus is the well. We don't need fences. We have the well. And things aren't getting hot around here. Like farmers in the outback of Australia, we don't bother with building fences. Rather, we dig a well. And listen to this. Real sheep won't stray too far from the well. And all are welcome to pursue him with us. All may come and drink. So what evidence or fruit reveals that we're pursuing the sinner and not just hanging around? (laughs) Well, lots of things. We're present with the church, of course. We're growing in our faith and over time showing signs of that. Fruit of the Spirit. We'll be talking about that this summer. We're repenting of sins. We're displaying the fruit of the Spirit. We are submitting to biblical instruction and correction. We're including ourselves in on what the Spirit is doing at Grantham Church. His book, uh, Reading Paul, New Testament scholar Michael Gorman writes, The inclusion that Paul experiences and preaches and practices is not an inclusion lacking teeth or limits. I don't know how you read the New Testament and come up with that. Right? Because it, it, it does have teeth. His gospel does not say all are welcome just as they are, but rather, hear this, all are welcome just as they are to be apprehended by and fully converted to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is the inclusion of the New Testament. Quite different, I should say, that which the world preaches. And just no one mistakenly thinks that belief and behavior don't matter. Let's zoom in further if you just look at the center. And if we were to zoom in further for a better understanding of what it looks like to be including yourself with us here at Grantham, uniting yourself to our community, and drinking from the well, here's how we can think about that. I've shown you this concentric circles graphic before. If Jesus is the center, if Jesus is the well... We need to specify that we're talking about the Jesus of the Gospels. Not the American Jesus, not the Republican Jesus, not the Democrat Jesus, the Jesus of the Gospels. And if you think that the Jesus of the Gospels can fit into your categories and boxes, folks, you are mistaken. This is the Jesus revealed in the New Testament. This is the Jesus of the center. And then, of course, moving out from that, but connected to that, which we confess in things like the creeds, which we'll do before communion this morning, is what we would call our confessions, our dogma, our most core beliefs that have made up orthodox, little old Christianity for two millennia. We continue to believe it. We continue to confess it, no matter how strange and subversive it may be. And then separating out from that is doctrine, specific beliefs and traditions of the church that you're in or the denomination that you're a part of, how we interpret the Bible, how we interpret our values and our distinctives. And then out from that are personal opinions. And notice that's on the far edge there. You ever met someone that can't tell the difference in these? That's a problem. Probably a bounded church. In the essentials, as one person said, in the essentials, let there be unity. In the peripherals, let there be freedom. And in all things, let there be love. We need to be able to tell the difference here if we're going to be a centered church. Again, Mark Baker says, shifting from fence building to digging wells also changes the role of beliefs within a church. When doctrines are treated as a, as a fence, they function as a litmus test. In a bounded church, doctrine can degenerate to mostly a means of defining who's in and who's out. But a centered church frees doctrine to be much more than just right belief. Doctrine becomes life-giving well water by helping people in the church align with and journey towards the center. The, the, the dogma, the doctrine, it keeps us on the road walking toward Christ. Lest we wander away from the well. Therefore, when disciples who identify with us are not making decisions in keeping with their aim, their arrow is pointing away from Christ 
maybe just in some area of their life, then we must kindly remind them of the lordship of Jesus and gently restore them as we ourselves would want to be helped in love, in love. And now for all those who call Grantham Church home, I want to invite us to take a step back and think about the messaging that you've heard from leadership in the past few years. Here's a screenshot of one of the pages on our website, Language and Culture. It's a fairly new page where we define some of the language that we use often here at Grantham. Things like intergenerational, convergent, third way, and here, of course, being a centered set church. Since 2016, we have been responding to the division and the polarization with these things, saying we're intergenerational. You know, there's some churches that just target a certain demographic or certain audience. We don't do that here at Grantham. We want to be not just multi-generational, but intergenerational. All of us worshiping together and seeing the value that each other brings. We also said we're not going to pick one worship style. We, we started the service off with an African-American song, right? And depending on what Sunday you're here, it can change. We said we're not going to just choose one preference or one style. That would be giving in to the spirit of the age and of the culture. So we're intergenerational and, and we're convergent, is what we call that. And we're third way. And third way means we're purposely pursuing a loving way to address injustice and work for more of the kingdom without mixing the gospel with partisan politics. We're not red, we're not blue, we're not about the elephant or the donkey, we're about the lamb, folks. This is not just rhetoric. It is the truth. It is the heart. It is the passion of our leadership. And we've used five words that capture this mission vision. Disciple, serve, welcome, witness, and unify. Unify. Jesus is the Son of God, we say, in loving union with the Father and Holy Spirit. Therefore, we promote and pursue diversity in our leadership and congregation. We embrace convergent worship. We model third-way unity that bridges the divides of political and theological differences. Does that resonate with you? I sure hope it does. We've been seeking here at Grantham to lay a foundation for unity, to lay a foundation for stability, a foundation for church health, preparing us, you see, to navigate the challenges and the disagreements and the threats to unity that might come from within our own congregation, from within our denomination even, or from broader communities around us and the country. You say threats? What threats? Well, if you haven't already noticed, it is an election year. We're, 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 we're see, seeing increasing polarization and division in American society. And, and fr fr frankly, sometimes I wonder if there's as much polarization and division as the media wants us to believe, because it makes for good ratings. But nevertheless, that is the perception. There's plenty to debate and argue. Many people are worried about the future. We're continually pressured to choose a side, which is often between two extreme positions. And discussions and decisions regarding matters of human sexuality, which have been going on openly in our culture for some time, are starting to build up within our own denomination. And so before I leave on a three-month sabbatical, starting May 1st, by the way, I want to remind you of who we are, who we aspire to be, and that we take serious Christ's call to unity at Grantham Church. Amen? Brothers and sisters, whatever happens, I believe this, we will be okay, because we've been preparing for this. Whatever comes, we'll stay on the path that we've been on for the last eight years. We're intergenerational. We're convergent. We're third way. And we seek to cultivate a centered set church community here at Grantham. 
we will not mimic or give in to the extremes of culture. If you agree with that and you're for that, will you just say amen this morning? Amen. So we need to be reminded of the Lord's heart about unity in the body. Consider how we can keep the unity of the Spirit at Grantham Church. I'm almost done. Here are a few things. You might want to take a picture of that or jot down some notes. How can we keep the unity of the Spirit at Grantham Church? Three things came to my mind. Number one, intentionally choose love over fear. Love over anger. You know, assuming the worst about people. Assuming you, you, you know what they think and believe. Choosing love over gossip. Did you hear? I, I'm, I'm just telling you because this is a prayer request. Yeah, somebody's heard that one before. Choosing love over slander. Choosing love. Number two, that we would stay centered on the God who looks like Jesus. Not on that thing that you're really passionate about. It may be important. It may be good. Jesus may care about it. You know, there, there's this one letter to the church in Revelation. I can't remember which one it is. John, you could remind me. <laughs> it says, you've forsaken your first love. I think it is Ephesus. It is, yeah, it's Ephesus. You've forsaken your first love. You know why they had forsaken their first love? Because they had gone after other good things but made it the center. Don't forsake your first love. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who's over all, in all, and through all. And lastly, number three, be on guard. Be on guard against the scattering forces of spiritual evil. Scattering forces of spiritual evil. Yes, listen to what Paul wrote in Ephesians 6, verse 11. He said, put on all of God's armor. This is a spiritual armor, notice. So that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Do you know the word for devil? In Greek, diabolos comes from the root meaning to scatter. The Greek word balo means to throw. Diabolos is to scatter and to cast apart. The devil is the one who scatters, divides, and rips apart. Don't be a part of the scattering. Verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this, in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Notice, the real enemy is at work behind the scenes, using and exploiting human beings who are, who are blinded by the truth, who live for their flesh, who are clearly not yielding to the Spirit, who do not know the way of Jesus. But we also know that the devil can manipulate believers to react and respond in unhealthy ways, to get sucked into that. My plea, my call, my challenge to us is don't do it. Don't be a part of of the one whose wiles and ways are to scatter. Verse 13, finally, therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Paul goes on in verse 14 through 18, he says, stand firm then, just listen to this, he says, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, again, this is armor, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, he says, take up the shield of faith, which you can use to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, again, spiritual armor, which is the Word of God. And then he says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, lastly, he says, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Finally, here's some questions for reflection and to help us respond together before 
we partake of communion, where we are reminded that we are one body of Christ. Number one, what would it look like for me to choose love over fear, over anger and gossip, cynicism? Let's throw that one in there. I imagine some of us are struggling with that one. And slander. What would it look like for me to choose love over all of these toxic things, both in the church and in the world? Now, what is the Holy Spirit bringing to your mind immediately? Hold on to that. Let the Lord speak to you about that. Let Him set you free. Number two, do I believe in a centered set church approach that reflects the way of Jesus? Am I living this way in my relationships at Grantham? And you might just say a quick little prayer. Maybe all you've known is bounded. Look, Lord, show me centered set. Show me your way. Lead me to the well. Because I want to lead others to the well. And then lastly, number three. As evil forces scatter and stir up division all around us, how is God inviting me to resist them? and fight for unity in our congregation. How can you help to promote a homothumadon church culture at Grantham? I trust that the Lord is speaking to you this morning. I pray that you'll respond in obedience. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace because we all fall so short of what you want. Would you forgive us? Forgive us for being bounded in more ways than one. Forgive us for being seduced by the polarizing, scattering forces of the enemy. Speak to our hearts, Lord. And God, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for the assurance of pardon and of mercy and grace. Lord, we prepare our hearts now before we come to the table. Lord, if there be any hostility, walls that are up in our own hearts, or any relationships in the church, would you remind us of the spiritual reality that you tore them down? And in the name of Jesus, we claim authority over those scattering forces of heart and mind. And we proclaim as spiritual fact and as a spiritual fight the oneness of your body. Would you grant that to us as only you can do, Lord, in the power of the Holy Spirit? As we come to your table, we ask, Lord, now that your Holy Spirit would work in mighty, powerful ways as we partake of your body and blood together. For it's in Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite our servers to come forward at this time, and also we'll welcome our children back into the sanctuary with us. Church, Psalm 133, verse 1 says, How good and pleasant it is 
when God's people live together in unity. Let's express our unity now in confessing the Apostles' Creed, which Christians confess all over the world. Let's do that together before taking communion. Would you join me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. It is now our sacred privilege to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. All who humbly put their trust in Christ and desire his help that they may lead a holy life, all who are truly sorry for their sins and would be delivered from them, all who would walk in love with their neighbors and intend to live a new life to glorify God and participate in the work of his kingdom, are invited to draw near with faith to receive this holy meal. Church, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ as they are delivered by the Apostle Paul, who wrote, For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord our God, send your Holy Spirit so that this bread and cup may be for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we and all your church be united with Christ and remain faithful in hope and love. Gather your whole church, O Lord, into the love and hospitality of your kingdom. Amen. In just a moment, we're going to invite you to come in and receive communion. Uh, we're prepared to offer you, as always, pre-sliced gluten-free bread so that you may dip the bread in the cup. If you'd prefer, you can take a communion packet from the basket, which will be at the station that you are nearest, um, as you hear the words of blessing over you, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. If you do need to stay seated the entire time, just raise your hand and a server will bring communion to you. Just do whatever you're comfortable with as we all extend grace to each other at the Lord's table. And as always, if you're watching from home, you can use uh, bread and wine, juice, where you are. And join us, please. Come to this sacred table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify, not that you are righteous, but that you are sincerely love the Lord Jesus Christ and desire to be his true disciples. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on the grace of God, but because in your sin you stand in constant need of the Spirit's presence and power. As the music plays, please come. creating one God Almighty through your Holy Spirit 
Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection.
oh God, we're reminded at this meal that none of us is better than another, that we're all in desperate need of you, and that you meet us where we are, and you walk with us as we lean into your love and your grace. Father, fill us with your spirit. Unite us together around Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Church, would you stand, receive this benediction this morning as we go out into the world to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Grantham Church, may you know the unity of Christ both as a spiritual fact and a spiritual fight. As you worship with this congregation and as you go out into the world, may you choose love, mercy, forgiveness over fear, anger, and hate. May you stay centered and guided by the God who looks like Jesus. And may you be on guard against the scattering forces of the evil one as you make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace, church, to love and serve the Lord. Amen.